Well, we are glad you're here today, and I'm starting a new series, and it is called Why Jesus? We have many questions in life. Uh, some of the questions that we have is, uh, you know, why am I here? What am I supposed to do while I'm here? What do I have to look forward to past this life? And uh, we are wanting those questions to be answered. There's a common word that's associated with all of this, and it's the word believe. Everybody say the word believe. Believe. We believe certain things in our life. In fact, in our search, we begin to believe certain answers to the questions that we have. Now that word believe is not associated, not just associated with our search, what do we believe in, but it's also associated with religion because the central part of religion is belief. We form some beliefs and develop religion, which is a culmination of these beliefs. And we get together in groups. Don't know if you knew this, but uh, in estimates, there are some 4,200 different religions in our world. In other words, people came together, looked at the questions that we have, came up with some answers that, you know, that we're looking for. And in those answers, they formed beliefs and then they developed a religion. Well, the question for us, if there are all these religions in the world, 4,200 of them, of which they would consider Christianity to be one, then why Jesus? Why should we choose Jesus? I mean, isn't that the main question that people ask? I mean, why can't I do this or why can't I do that? Why can't I choose this way or choose that way? Well, there's a big difference between Christianity and other religions. First of all, we don't consider Christianity to be a religion. It is about Jesus. You see, in religion, it is about beliefs. It's about a set of rules. But with Jesus, it's about a person. It's about a person that we have a relationship with. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. And that's what separates Christianity from all of these other religions. But even though I say that, then why should we, why should we choose Jesus? Because people continue to have a problem with us saying that, that he's the one that we, should, that we should choose. I want to talk about that problem really quick. On your outline sheet, let's go ahead and fill that in. The problem. So what is the problem? It's this that people want to find their own way and not the way. When you look at the scripture, we hear a part of the story and there was, you know, the apostles and one of those apostles, uh, his name was Thomas and he was referred to as doubting Thomas because he doubted what was going on with Jesus and all this stuff. So he asked a question. Now, Jesus uh, had just talked about going to be with his father and, uh, you know, being there in the presence of God. And Thomas had a question about it. And actually, it's a common question that we have. And I want you to hear the question, but I, want, I also want you to hear the answer that Jesus gave to it. It's found in John chapter 14, beginning in verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? No, he just said, I'm going to be with my father. He's like, well, where is that? And how do I get there? How do I get to heaven, basically? Then Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. That's the problem. His answer, Jesus' answer, is the problem that other religions have with Christianity. You're so arrogant to say that Jesus is the only way. Why should I believe that? Why should I come to the conclusion and say that he's the only way? Well, people do have different beliefs about this. They, uh, in fact, they don't want to they don't want to be forced into believing, you know, certain things about God that all of us have to be, all of us have to believe about God. Yet there are other things in life that all of us believe in. I'll give you an example: gravity. Right? You didn't get up this morning to say, "I think I'll float today." You didn't say that. Your feet are on the ground because gravity is real. Gravity is something that exists. Gravity is something that we all believe. But why is, it that, why is it there are things about God that some people, that they don't believe? 
because they see information and they come to different ideas about what they see. Y'all may have uh, seen this on the internet. It's like a year or two ago. It's the dress that broke the internet. It was a dress, right? And people were saying, well, it's this color, it's that color, it's this color, it's that color. And they, people looked at the same thing and they thought it was different colors. There's another one of those pictures out now and it's about a boy who is on a swing in front of a building. And the question is, is he swinging toward the building or is he swinging away from the building? Uh, I was with our kids yet. Actually, our kids are the ones who showed it to me the other day and they had one uh, answer and I had a different. And of course, I'm right. Okay. I don't know uh, what the right answer is, but you look at it, the same information and you come up with different conclusions. Doesn't that kind of sound like religion? You look at what's happening in the world and you see all this stuff and some people conclude, this is what I should believe and other people conclude, this is what I should believe. Well, why Jesus? I'll give you another just example about religion and, and why they believe what they believe. <coughs> There's the story, and some of you may have heard this before, about three blind men. And the blind men are taken to an elephant and each of the blind men are taken to a different part of the elephant. So one blind man touches the, the foot of the elephant and says, uh, it's rough. Then another blind man is taken to the tail and he feels the end of the tail and says, it's furry. And another blind man is taken to the trunk and he, it, and he feels the trunk and he said, it's thin and it bends. All three of them went and touched different parts of the animal and had different thoughts about what they had just touched. Now, the only way to know what the elephant is really like is for somebody who can see to see the whole elephant, right? Well, the illustration through that is this. Many religions believe that those three blind men are like different religions, that they see different parts of the elephant. In other words, they see different parts of God. For example, Christianity, uh, you know, touches the foot and they say, this is what God is like. And then uh, uh, some people who believe in Muhammad touch the tail and they say it's furry. This is what God is like. Some people uh, touch the trunk and it's thin and it bends and they say this. Uh, the Buddhists say this. No, this is what God is like. And this is why we can all believe different things about God and we can come together because we can see different parts of God. But there's something that is different in this. Jesus is the elephant. You see, Jesus, and obviously the elephant represents God, but didn't Jesus come from heaven to earth to show us who God is and what he's like? So when we open our eyes and see Jesus, the elephant, we see exactly who God is. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we don't need to trust in all these religions that say, I know this part of God, this part of God. Isn't it better to know the whole part of God and to see him in human flesh? And here's the other part of it. It's not just knowledge in mind, it's knowledge and relationship with him. That's why Jesus. Well, we know that there are many people in this search, and that's the second thing I wanna to talk to you about today, so you can put that on your outline sheet. <clears throat> the search, and we know that we all are searching. Again, I keep saying answers, answers to questions. We're searching for answers to questions, but where do we begin our search? Well, it's the same for all of us. We're born in the world, so where do we try to find what to believe in? We try to find what to believe in the world. We try to find what to believe about what the world tells us will bring us happiness and life. Well, John spoke of this. And John spoke about the difference between what people who live for the world are like and what the people who live for God are like. I wanna read this scripture to you. It's in 1 John chapter two. It says this, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, there's a big difference between the world and the Father. The world is a place. The Father is a person. Even in his explanation, he's helping them understand it's not about what the world has that you can gravitate toward and grab onto. It's about God who you can know. 
So if we look at this world, what are the characteristics of what people believe about the world? I want to share some of that with you because this is where people are coming from who are searching for the answers and they need to know why should I... Why should I look to Jesus? The characteristics of the search. The first one is this, that they love the world. The first thing it said, do not love the world or anything in it. We need to, to choose God, but many people choose to love the world and they want what the world offers. Well, what does it offer? It offers wealth, right? It offers pleasure. It offers influence. It offers, uh, you know, people looking to us and thinking that we're awesome and amazing because of what it is that we do. We look to those many different ideals of the world and say, if I do those things, that they'll make me happy. That's why I'm going to live for the world. I love the world, but there's a problem with that. Look at the second thing on your outline sheet. It says they lust. Everybody wants love. And they call what they have for the world love, hoping that it will fill that void of love. But what John says is it's not love, it's lust. Here's the issue with all of it. The world can't love you back, but God can, right? All of those things we live for, we hope are gonna make us feel good, but those things cannot make us feel good because they can't love us back. It's not relationship. So what do we do? Well, many people who are still relying on the things of the world and saying, this is the way for me, they become very prideful as they turn their back on God. So look at the next statement on your sheet. They're prideful. There are people who say, man, I know the way. I hear what you're saying, but I know the way. If I do this, I'm gonna experience, I have what I have, uh, you know, have what I want, be happy, all of these things. And they become very prideful and they, they take control of their life. And in control of their life, you become very prideful because I'm in control. In other words, you become the God of your own life because whoever the God is, is the one who's in control. Well, what else is there about this? What is the true problem and issue with this? Look on your outline sheet, look at the next thing. They're always wanting more. They're always wanting more. The scripture, John said this in verse 17, the world and its desires pass away. Did you hear that? What I desire, in other words, what I lust, it passes away. So if it passes away, what do I need? I need something else to fill the void of what I'm looking for because these things that I keep hoping and trusting in, they're not filling it. Why? Because it's not love, it's lust. So anytime we live for anything in the world that we say is gonna make my life great, that discludes a relationship especially the relationship with God, is lust. There's a big difference between the two. Well, what do we do then? Here are these people who are going through all this. They're trying to figure things out. It's not working in their life. What do we do? Well, we wanna help them find the answers to the questions. We wanna help them understand why Jesus. Now I wanna talk about the questions. On your sheet, go ahead and fill that in. What are the questions? Now, already we heard one of the questions because Thomas, remember, doubting Thomas, had asked the question. Look at it again. It says this in verse 5 of John 14. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? In other words, you're going to go to heaven. You're going to be with God. How do I get there? How do we get there? And that's one of the questions that we ask about life. There are several questions that we have. Our belief, our religion is formed through finding people who answer these questions that we believe in. Every person has the same question, so they look at you know, things in the world and they say, well, here's the, this provides an answer for this, this provides an answer for this, this provides an answer for this, so I can believe in all, all those things, and they put them together, and then that's their religion of belief. So why Jesus? Well, I wanna share, you, share with you the questions. And I, just very quickly, because in the next few weeks, I'm going to talk about these in detail. I want to talk with you or share with you why Jesus and how Jesus answers the question that we have. First question is this, where did I come from? All of us want to know that question. We want to know, was I created? Was I, you know, whatever? Am I some big cosmic accident? All of those things. Why should I believe in Jesus? Because Jesus was there in the beginning. 
In John chapter one, verse one and verse 14, it says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word refers to Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was the elephant. Yo, that was funny right there, okay? Maybe not. And Jesus was God, that's what it says. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. In the what? The beginning. The beginning of all creation. Okay, I hear you say the beginning of creation. So why should I even believe that? Well, Jesus has an answer for that. There are a couple of things that happen in Jesus' life that prove his power over creation and over the physical world. One was called the virgin birth. There's only one. There, to, to have a virgin birth, to be impregnated, Mary to be impregnated by God, is power over the physical world. Okay, you're saying, okay, Tim, I hear that, but honestly... I mean, that's just what they say, there was a virgin birth. How do you know that there wasn't a relationship between Joseph and Mary, and it was that? I mean, I hear what they say, the claim about that. Okay, I get that, I hear that. But there was a second thing that happened that actually was the catalyst for the spread of Christianity around the world. It was the resurrection of Jesus. To be resurrected, to come back to life after you're dead, requires the power over the physical world to bring something into existence that did not exist before. I say it was the catalyst for the spread of Christianity because when Jesus came back, because they were like freaking out. Jesus died on the cross. Well, we believed all this stuff. What are we supposed to do now? And they're gathering together. And then Jesus appears to the disciples and who comes up to him trying to figure it out? Doubting Thomas, he's like, look, just feel my, the pierces in my hand. Here, here he is, he appears to all these people, not only the disciples, but 500 other people, and those people who saw Jesus, physically saw Jesus and touched Jesus, began telling everyone about Jesus, and many of those very people went to their death saying it was him. Now, I'm just saying to you, if I wasn't for sure it was him, I don't think I would say, yeah, it was him, if I knew I was gonna die. The fact that they would be willing to give their life and claim that this man was real and had power over death proves his power over the physical world. Doesn't Jesus answer this question? Look at the next one. It says this, uh, why am I here? Why do I matter? Well, all you have to do is look at Jesus and Jesus came to bring peace in the world. Jesus came so that we would come together. Jesus came so that we would know what love is. And uh, in Jesus coming, this is what he did. Jesus came to serve and to live to serve and not to live to be served. Now that's a way in which we're supposed to live our life. And I'll just tell you this, if there's gonna be peace, this is what is required, is it not? This is what brings peace. Here's the third thing, what are the rules? What are the rules I'm supposed to live by? Everybody wants to know the rules. We hear about the Ten Commandments and the Old Testament. If you look at other religions, they have rules for their religions. These are the things that you're supposed to do in how you live. Jesus answers this question. Why Jesus? Because Jesus lived out the rules. It's not a religion going and touching an elephant's foot and saying, well, to do this part of God, I gotta follow these rules. Another way to say, well, to be like this, I gotta follow these rules. Instead, it's Jesus who came to show us how to live by the rules. And this is what he showed, y'all, this is so, it seems so simplistic in our mind and our thoughts, but this is it. The way to live is to just put other people before yourselves. That's the rule, okay? To love God, and to love other people, we hear this all the time, and to love other people. If you love other people, you always stay within the lines of the rules because you always do what's best for them and not, not what's worse for them. How many of y'all like coloring? Anybody y'all like to color? I mean, you can admit it. I mean, as adults, you can do that. Okay, I don't know, four or five of us. I, I'm serious, I like to color. I know it's weird. I, this is so annoying I, you know, for people when I, we'll go to a restaurant, especially when our kids were young. We'll go to a restaurant and they'll give the kids a coloring book and colors. And it's like, well, where's the adult version of that? That's what I ask them. It's like, why do the kids get to have all the fun and we can't do this? I found this really awesome coloring book, basically, app uh, on, you know, on, on my phone. 
It was really, it's because I seriously, all I do this, it was a color by number. I just did it yesterday, okay? And it wasn't for illustration, it's just like I'm weird. I just thought it'd be fun, okay? So it's a color by number. So you have this picture and all the lines, it's got little numbers, like you're supposed to color the numbers. And on the very bottom of it, it's got all the numbers in different colors, like one is blue and two is all the different colors. And you just push on one and you go up and find the one and push the one. And all of a sudden, the color comes in that thing. Y'all, it's amazing. And when you finish doing it, it is a beautiful picture and all of the colors are in the lines. Isn't that great? And it makes a beautiful thing. And when you look at life, when we stay within the lines of every part of our life, it's a beautiful thing because it represents who God is and the love that he has for us. What are the rules? What happens after I die? Isn't that the question basically Thomas was asking? Where are you going? How do I get there? Going to heaven? I want to be there too. It was his question. The question basically is this. When I die, do things go black? Or when I die, can I experience new life? Let's get back to the resurrection because the resurrection answers this question. Jesus, when he died... Things didn't just go black, that he died. But Jesus came back to life. And when he came back to life, it wasn't just proving to the people that Jesus has power over the natural world. It was a message to the people that even in your death, I have the power to bring new life to you. It's through me that I have the power to give you new life. In fact, if you want to know how to go to heaven, where we experience this new life, it's through me who can provide a way for you. He answers the question. Here's the next one. Who or what should I love? Well, that's a good question. Whatever we love, we're attracted to. Whatever we love uh, motivates us. Whatever we love, we're committed to. So again, it's just, I've already talked about this. Who am I supposed to love? Am I supposed to love something that's temporary? Something that doesn't talk to me, something that doesn't help me in times of need, something that is not a relationship, or do I need someone, again, who cares for me? This is why it's so difficult for many people uh, who have relationships with people, and they're terrible relationships. They're terrible relationships. I, I, I especially think about people who have relationships with parents. Uh, and again, especially those people who have, who have parents who are dads and they have a terrible relationship with their dad and their dad abuses them and says terrible things about them and all of this stuff that their dad does. So when you're talking about a heavenly father, this is what happens a lot of time. They associate their dad with the father in heaven. You know what they need to know? The father in heaven would never, ever treat you like your dad. Because the father in heaven is the one who wants you to experience life and love. It's about a relationship. It answers the question, how can I make a difference? That's, oh wait, here's the next one. How do I get through the ups and downs of life? Jesus answers that question. I'll help you understand that. Jesus was accused. Jesus was rejected. Jesus experienced pain. And Jesus was murdered. He was killed. Now, if Jesus can go through all of that stuff and still be talking about his father, and even look down at the the people who are murdering him, who are killing him, and say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. How in the world can we say it's not possible for us to get through the rejections of our life, the difficulties of our life, the things that are hard in our life? Instead, though, we allow those those experiences to control us. Uh, it's New Year's and you know, many people make New Year's resolutions. I've, you know, I've made a couple of resolutions. Uh, one of them is to, to see things in a positive perspective because I have a tendency, I, I'm that person who always um, prepares for the worst. 
Some of y'all might be like that too. And because of that, it makes me think sometimes more negatively and positive. So that's one of the things I wanna be more positive and frame things in a more positive way. Here's another one, uh, to not talk about Jennifer as much in sermons, okay? Now, I hope you heard what I just said, not to talk as much about Jennifer in sermons. I didn't say not to talk about her. In fact, by the end of this service, if the Spirit moves me to talk about her, I will, all right? But I didn't in the last service. Anyway, you know, things like that. I know that's kind of a funny one. But there are, other, there are other New Year's resolutions that people have made that I thought were just really intriguing and, and really awesome. One of the people said this, that they resolved to not live for the moment, but for a movement. Isn't that great? When I read that, it's like, wow, that is heavy stuff right there. Because so often we live for the moment and these things that are happening to us, again, they might be bad, difficult things that are going through us. And we focus on that the moment instead of remembering there's a movement. And that movement is the love of God that those people need and the love of God that I need to be expressing to other people. Here's another one that uh, I read that I thought was really good. It was the resolution to forget the past and stop being angry and holding grudges against people who are stealing my joy. Isn't that a great resolution? Some of you are like, wait a second, really? Isn't that a great resolution? Because it's those type of things that keep us from doing what we do. And instead of getting through the downs of life, we're allowing them to control us. Jesus was able to get through. So, so can we. Who's the answer? Jesus. Here's the final one. How can I make a difference? And I'll just give you a, a, just a quick statement. One person at a time. How's that? And now Jesus worked. Yes, there were crowds of people who came and he shared the message and people believed, but often he would share one person at a time with a thief, with an adulterous woman, with whoever it may have been, one person at a time. In other words, for me to form relationships with other people, Jesus is my example. Now, aren't these really great reasons of why Jesus? I mean, really, when you look at all this stuff, it's about love and about how it is that we respond to him and why we would give our life to him. Okay, well, there are different responses to him, and that's what I wanna talk about right now. On your outline sheet, fill that in, the responses, and there's a big portion of scripture on there. <clears throat> Don't fret, I'm not gonna read it all. I'm gonna tell you the story. I'm gonna read some portions of it to you so you'll see it. One of the best, and some of y'all may have heard, I've shared this story before, but some of y'all may have heard this before. It's, the, to me, the best example in the Bible of what I'm talking about of people who were trying to figure out what they were supposed to believe in and had different responses to it. Paul had an encounter with Jesus, okay? He was on the road to Damascus. It was from that that Paul believed in him, believed in Christ, gave his life to him, and began serving him. Now, some of you may know this about Paul, that Paul used to persecute Christians and all that stuff, and it was a life-changing moment for him, and he gave his life to Christ. Well, Paul began telling people about Jesus, about his life, how he lived, how he died, and about his resurrection. Paul was instrumental in the message of Christ being spread around the world. He would go from city to city to city to tell people the story. One of the cities that he went to was a place called Athens, which all of us in here are familiar with. It's where the Greek gods were. It's all this stuff, these different religions, different people had different beliefs. Well, he went there to share the message and a crowd gathered around him and he began talking about the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus and about how it is that God loves them and how they can give their life and experience a relationship with, with Christ. Okay, that's what he talked about. Well, in the crowd, there were a lot of different types of people in the crowd. It represented a lot of different religions, I'm sure. But two religions that are mentioned in the scripture are Epicureans that were in the crowd and Stoics. Now, what Epicureans believed was that what you are to live for in life is pleasure, and the way to experience pleasure is indulgence. 
came from the teaching of a guy named Epicurus, and that's what he taught, and they believed that. The greatest way to experience pleasure, that, that life is about pleasure, and the greatest way to experience pleasure is through indulgence. And you know that many of the things that they did and the Greek religions, all that kind of stuff, was about pleasure. Well, that's what they believed. Okay, the Stoics believed it wasn't about pleasure at all. Uh, with the Stoics, they believed it was all about self-control that we can control our life no matter what's happening to us, okay? We're in control. We control how we feel about that. Therefore, because of our control, we can control things around us, right? Or control emotionally how we feel about these things in life. So it's all about their self-control. It's what I do in my power. These are the two. But don't those sound common to what people believe now? I mean, seriously. This is what these two groups of people believe. So they hear Paul. It's like, okay, I heard Paul. Um, and then after he gets through speaking, these two groups of people, our representatives, come up to Paul and say, hey, will you come with us because we wanna talk to you more about this. So they take Paul to a gathering place called the Areopagus. And the Areopagus is just this area where they come in and the thinkers, the intellectuals of that day would get together and debate certain topics. Well, they brought Paul in and they wanted basically <laughs> to hear from Paul so they could debate the topic. So Paul comes in and he begins talking to them about what he had just said before. So he, he says this, I was walking around in the streets the other day and I came across a statue and that statue uh, was built in the name of the unknown God. Okay, so here's a statue and it's written on it, the unknown God. So I walked around and see that y'all have this God, an unknown God, that you're not sure who this God is. And we know, this is just a side note, we know that that unknown God was important because they would swear in the name of the unknown God when they would make commitments to each other. I swear in the name of the unknown God when they were making commitments, agreements with each other. Okay, so Paul, it's like, okay, these are your, he understands their beliefs. He understands there's this unknown God thing out there which causes them to be like, there, there's something out there that he still haven't figured out and there's the statue that proves it. So he begins to talk to them about it. Now I'm gonna start reading in verse 22. It might be a little redundant here, but Paul, Paul then stood up, it's the very first part of the scripture. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. You formed these beliefs, Epicurean Stoics, okay? For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, here it is, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Then, a few verses later in verse 28, he tells them who it is. For in him, the unknown God, for in him we live and move and have our being. In other words, he's the reason why we're here. Where did I come from? He just answered that question. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Now, why would he say that? I love it when things come together because none of those things can love them back. Not one of those things can love them back. And here they were believing in these other things about God. And he basically explained to them, look, the reason why I'm talking to you is about God's love. Jesus came to serve other people. It's about God's love. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Why? Because he loves you and he didn't want you to die on the cross for your sins. He wanted to take the punishment for you. And here's the other thing. Jesus, when he was put to death, came back to life. He was resurrected, which proves he is more powerful than any belief that you have in another thing or object or anything else. Because there is only one who can bring things back to life, and it is God. There's only one. So he explained these things to the people. Well, they responded to it, the responses, right? I want to share with you what the responses were. Uh, actually, I want to read it to you. This portion is actually on the screen. The rest of it wasn't. And you can read the story. It's all that big scripture that I just told you about. In verse 32, it says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, so he told him all, all this, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on the subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. This was the response. Let's write them down. 
Some refused to believe. How do we see that? They sneered. Isn't that what they said? It says they sneered at what he had said. Why did they sneer? Fill this in. They don't like the answers. They don't like the answers that, that he just gave. Why would they not like the answer? Okay, I'll just, you don't have to raise your hand. I'll just give you a couple of ideas. Because they didn't want to give up living for pleasure, doing the things that they like to do that gave them pleasure. Here's another thing. They didn't want to give control of their life to anybody else because they like being in control of everything. So they sneered at it. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Here's a second group of people, though. Some considered. They considered. They heard what he said. There was not outright disbelief, but they were thinking about it. Why? Fill this in. Because they aren't sure. They aren't sure about what he said. That word sure is really important. And it has to do really with facts. And this is a big deterrent for people giving their life to Christ. You know, the why Jesus, why they don't do it, because of this. They want to know for sure that God is God and that Jesus is God. They want to know for sure. Show me the facts, and this is what it is. I know for sure what you're saying to me is true. That, that, that's the way they, they want it. It's like gravity. I know I'm here. Prove to me that Jesus is here. Now, what we know, y'all, no person in this room today has seen God, have we? We haven't seen God. If we saw God, that would be a fact. It's, I've seen God. Uh, none of you here today, you know, have seen Jesus. And, and, and you know, since he was resurrected, right? None of you have seen him. So for you, we believe that and trust in that. Because here, here's the reason why we believe it. Because the fact, it's a fact. The fact is that the people who did see Jesus gave their life for what they saw because they knew it to be a fact. A fact. We have a faith in a God because of the fact of the people seeing the resurrection and it's spreading from person to person to person. Now, this is the problem. They want to see it and touch it and smell it and all that stuff. Isn't that what the deal was with Thomas? I want to touch his hand. I want to feel it. I want to see it and touch it. All those kind of things. That's what we want to do. And I'm not going to believe until you can do that. Y'all, it's not just about fact. It's about faith. Do the facts add up where I can have faith that there is a God and there's a Jesus who loves me. There's fact and faith. I, I'll explain it to you this way. As many you know, I'm a sailor <coughs> and uh, there's something, it, it's, I love sailing because you don't just push gas and which is fun by the way, I, I enjoy doing that too. But you really have to think about what you're doing. On a sail, there are some things called telltales. And telltales are basically yarn. And there's one piece of yarn on the outside of the sail, and there's another piece of yarn on the inside of the sail. Well, th this is kind of really scientific. It's, it's really kind of weird. Uh, when you're sailing into the wind, all right, you need those telltales to be flying straight back, which says the appropriate amount of wind is going on both sides of the sail. Now, there's a reason for that, because it's all about high pressure and low pressure. On one side of the sail is high pressure. On the other side of the sail is low pressure. The wind does not push you. It pulls you. Isn't that crazy? It's like a, it's, it's like a wing on a plane. There's high pressure and low pressure, and that pressure, when it's right, pulls the plane up. It's the exact same way. For when both of those things are in line, there is movement in a certain direction. But if one of those is not in line, it causes the boat to slow down and begin to stall. That's what happens. Both of them need to be in line. Now I want you to think about the two telltales. One is fact and one is faith. I see these facts about you. I see it and I hear about it in the resurrection, the people who did this. I see it in the lives of people around me that they would love and even share the message with me. To be willing to be persecuted for whatever. The fact is I see so many of these things about God and, and I can look at Jesus and Jesus is a, it makes sense, okay? If this is true, it makes sense that these answers about Jesus could be true. So I look at those facts and all of that and I put that conclusion together. And when I say, if there are enough facts, I choose to place my faith. 
some people have been listening to the facts. Yeah, I hear all these facts, but they haven't chosen to place their faith. Y'all, this is so good. When I place my faith and say, you know what? I believe it is true that I finally found somebody who can love me back because none of this other stuff is. And I trust and believe in him. The telltale goes back and there is movement toward God. Isn't that great? There is movement toward God. I want to remind you about um, what I said just a moment ago about the resolution, right? One of the resolutions is I don't want to live for the moment. I want to be a part of the movement to be a part of that. Okay, is there something? They aren't sure. Okay, this is the last thing. Some believed, all right? Some believed. In the scripture, it said that it, it listed some names of people who believed. And then it, the last statement says this, and a number of others. Isn't that cool? He's talking. I want you to get the scene again. He's talking to some of the most intellectual people in the community who were seen as the brains. You know, they're like, they're the ones who made all the A's. They're the doctors. They're, like, they're all these people. And out of that group of people, these intellectual people, out of that group of people, after Paul spoke, a number of the intellectuals gave their life to God and believed. 